Uh, welcome to this uh, HPRC clusters primer. Uh, my name is Dylan, and today we're going to be talking about the Terra cluster. Um, so if you just got here um, and you're using a Windows machine, um, you have two choices to connect to the cluster. Um, I'm on a Mac, so I'm going to use my uh, terminal just to SSH in. Um, we're not going to be doing too many like activities on there, but um, it helps if you can if you log on, you can also follow along. Um, before you can connect to the Terra cluster um, or any of our clusters, Terra, uh, Ada, or Curry, um, you have to be on the VPN. So actually, let me connect to the VPN right now. Smart. Um, so there's this. I don't know how to connect to it. Um, or if you if you're familiar with the VPN. Uh, you're going to need to be connected to the campus Wi-Fi. If you're off campus, um, if you're on campus, obviously you're, you're fine as long as you're connected to um, the Tamu Link WPA um, Wi-Fi access point. So uh, if you're on a Windows, Windows machine, you can download Mobile Xterm, um, Google search Mobile Xterm or follow this link. And then you're going to want the installer edition, which is the green one. Um, download it, unpack it, and then run it and it'll it's an SSH client, so you can um, get in. Oh, let me open the chat. I'll try and monitor the chat. Um, Shana will be there, so if you guys have any questions and I miss it, uh, Shana or one of the other staff members will, will get you. Okay, so let's go ahead and start talking about Terra. So Terra is um, one of our clusters. This is actually a picture of Terra from the data center uh, over at Teague above Help Desk Central. Um, I Central Campus Garage. Uh, Terra has uh, three login nodes. Um, on its compute nodes, it has 28 cores uh, for each node. So it's a two socket uh, thing. It's got 14 cores per socket. Uh, the majority of the nodes are 64 gigabyte memory nodes. Um, there's 256 of them. Um, there are some KNL Knights Landing uh, 5 cards there. Um, they don't charge SUs when you run on them. Um, so if you have code that can use a FI card, uh, you have 16, 16 mostly open uh, choices right there. Um, and then the other accelerators are um, the K80, NVIDIA K80 GPUs, um, which of which there are 48 uh, nodes which have these uh, GPUs attached um, and they have 128 gigabytes of memory. So we're gonna talk about that kind of stuff later, uh, like how much the, what the memory requirements and stuff like that, what that means for the nodes. Um, but this is the general overview. There's three login nodes. Um, oh, I didn't put it on this slide, but um, there is one login node, Terra 3. Um, Terra 3 has a GPU attached. I think it's a K82. Uh, yeah, I think it's a K80. Um, so it's basically the same. Um, and the login nodes have uh, 128 gigs of memory as well. Um, so we have a little diagram here. Why is this going? Okay, well, this um, this diagram kind of shows the connection uh, that, or, or it shows the uh, kind of the workflow from when you connect and submit jobs and stuff. Um, so if you're on campus, um, like I said, you connect to the campus network, um, and then from the campus network, you use an SSH client, just like we're going to use right now, um, to log in to the clusters, and you land on the login nodes. Uh, from the login nodes, you create a job script. Uh, again, talk about this later. This is um, towards the end of the class. Uh, you create the job script, uh, which becomes a job script file, which is just a text file with some instructions to the computer that uh, tells the computer how you want to run. Um, you submit the job script, and then the job script is submitted to the batch manager or the job scheduler, whatever you want to call it. On Terra, uh, we use Slurm. So you submit the uh, job script to Slurm, and then this uh, job scheduler puts it in a queue uh, based on the parameters, um, the resources that you requested in your job script file. Uh, and then eventually, it'll after some time, it'll run on a compute node somewhere. Uh, and then the output is uh, put out wherever you specified it, typically in the work directory that you sent the job in from. Um, and then from the login node, you can see the output files and stuff. Um, it works the exact same way if you're off campus. Um, if you're off campus, uh, you're connected to the internet like we all are right now. And then you, you connect to the VPN before you um, SSH in. So if I tried to SSH in before I connected to the VPN up here, 
um, the connection would just hang and then eventually it would be denied. Um, uh, yeah, so um, after the, um, after this is over, um, later today, we're gonna uh, publish these PDFs right there uh, where Shana put that link. Okay. So accessing Terra, um, the only way, or so SSH is the command that we use to, to connect to Ada or Terra. Um, if you're on campus, uh, we can just run this command right here straight from our terminal. Um, this is the command. I should have highlighted this in green, but um, oops. Um, SSH net ID at Terra dot time edu. That's the syntax for it. Um, again, if you're off campus, you're going to need to be on the VPN. Um, if you don't know how, if you've never used a VPN before, right here, this, um, let me uh, copy this link and I'll put this in the chat for us. Um, um, that is the link to uh, the page that the IT page that'll help you set up the VPN. Um, so two factor authentication is enabled for, um, for, for CAS, which is how we uh, authenticate and uh, also for the VPN and for SSH. So if you log into the cluster, you have to have VPN uh, duo set up, which you should have done because it's it's been required for a while. Um, so since we're gonna use SSH, uh, I think newer Windows systems have SSH built in with the Linux subsystem. Um, I don't have a Windows, so I, I don't really know, but um, there are some SSH, some free SSH programs that you can use uh, if you don't have a super up-to-date Windows machine. Mova Xtrem was the one that we we recommended. Um, you might also be familiar with Putty SSH. Uh, Mova Xtrem is just Putty with a whole bunch of nicer features. Putty is very bare bones. It works, but it's very uh, bare bones. Um, Mova Xtrem uh, already comes with X11 uh, forwarding configured and ready to go, um, and also has some other cool built-in features. Um, so those are your two options uh, for an SSH client. Uh, well, there's many more, but uh, these are the two that we kind of support the most uh, and are most familiar with. Um, if you would prefer to use, not, not to download anything, you can actually access it through the portal. So we have a web portal which you could uh, go to and log into. Again, this is all contingent that you have an HPRC account already, um, assuming that you signed up for the Ada and Terra class. I'm guessing that you probably have applied for an account and you have one. Um, so if you've applied for an HPRC account and you have one and you've been approved and all that, you can go here to portal.hprc.tamware.edu, which again, I will uh, post over here in the chat. Uh, does new Windows have a bash included? I'm a Mac person, they just don't have a PC. Um, some of them do, it's the it's called the, the Linux subsystem. Um, I, I might just recommend that they download Moba Xterm anyway, because um, that's that's the way that will work for everybody, you know. So you want to just kind of encompass the the way that grabs the most people. Um, I would say just tell them download Moba Xterm or or download Putty. Um, it's really their preference. Um, I think some of them do. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Shayna will probably know more about that. Um, so so I put the portal link there. If you want to use the portal. Uh, what you'll do is you'll you'll just go there and it will. Uh, let's see if I can open it up. The portal will look like uh, this portal. Hprc.tamer.edu. Um, when you go here, you're going to actually have to log in through CAS, so it's going to ask for your net ID and your password. Um, I'm already like logged in everywhere, so it just recognizes me. Um, but you're going to be thrown on this page. Um, we're going to, we're on Terra. So uh, obviously click Terra and oh, actually I lied. It's going to make me do this. Okay. So once you log in, uh, this is what the portal looks like. And then you can access, you can access the cluster all through up here, but specifically we would want um, uh, shell, shell access. So right here. Clusters, Terra shell access. This is if you want to use the portal. Otherwise, you're, we, we're going to SSH um, into, into Terra. So, so this is what it looks like. Yeah, this is like an SSH connection in there. So let me find my slides again. Okay. 
Um, so like I said earlier, uh, Tara's got three login nodes. Um, you can check the bash prompt to, to see which one you're on. Um, I think it actually says, I don't know if it'll say Tara three, it'll say like T login um, 0501, two or three. Um, and then here's the important things. Uh, login sessions uh, that are idle for 60 minutes will be closed automatically. So if you log into the cluster, um, and uh, you kind of you leave your computer, you forget about what you're doing or whatever, um, your session will die after 59 minutes and 59 seconds. Also, um, processes that are running for longer than 60 minutes will be also killed automatically. This is on the login node. This, spec this applies specifically to the login nodes. Um, when you submit jobs, obviously you can submit jobs that are longer than 60 minutes. That's kind of the whole point of high performance computing. Um, but this is specifically about the login nodes um, because the login nodes are not really where you run your jobs or where you log in and um, configure your jobs and then send them off to run. Um, so that's why these uh, limits are in place. Also, uh, we ask that you do not use more than eight cores on a login node. So remember uh, the login nodes are um, similar to the compute nodes. They have 28 cores and uh, I wanna say 128 gigs of memory. Um, so if you run a process that uses more than eight cores, um, you're gonna be disrupting other people because uh, it, it's not just you on the login node, there's probably you know, at peak times, maybe a hundred people on that login node as well. And there's only three of them. We've, we've had people um, run Python stuff that spawns a whole bunch of processes and, and crashes login nodes and it's a big deal because it, it bothers other people. So don't be mean. Um, Try not to run stuff there. You you can you can test your code there. Just try, you know try to limit it to smaller than eight or eight or smaller. And also don't use sudo. Uh, it's not like you could even if you tried to, but um, you shouldn't because it emails all of the admins saying you tried to use sudo. So um, you you don't need sudo to do anything on the cluster. Um, all the software that's there, all the software that is there, is available to you. You don't need to use sudo to use it. Um, sudo is more of like a, of an administrative command that you would use to, to configure the clusters and stuff. Um, so I promise you probably don't need it. And if you do need it, uh, or if you think you need it, then you should probably have a chat with us and we could figure out how to get your stuff to run without using sudo. Um, we don't bite. Okay, our first pop quiz. Um, I've never actually done polling in Zoom before. Um, so Shane is gonna help me out with this one. Um, Ah, there it is. Okay. So, which one of the following is not an HPRC cluster? Is it A, Ada, B, Bozo, C, Curry, or D, Terra? Okay, so the one who chose Terra, I'm sure, I, I'm sure the wording of the question got you. Oops. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, how many people do we have in here? 31. Uh, of 28 people. You're a smart group. This is what my professors must feel like. I'm an undergrad student, by the way. Um, I don't have really time to go into my background, but I've been working at HPRC for a couple of years. But okay, perfect. Yeah, uh, Bozo is the correct answer. Um, Ada, Tara, and Curry are our clusters, and then we. Uh, Nice. Perfect, okay. Yeah, Bozo, cool name, uh, name for a clown, not, not for a cluster. All right, next slide. Uh, here's the slide on two-factor, two-factor authentication. You guys are probably familiar with it. Uh, it's through Duo, um, NetID, blah, 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 um, enhances security, all that stuff. Uh, so all the web logins, you know, we all have to use it now for everything, so I'm sure you guys are Sure, you guys love it. I love it. It's so much. It's so fun. Um, you do have to authenticate with Duo um, through SSH uh, every time you SSH or create an SFTP connection because um, SFTP connections have SSH connections underlying them. Um, this was rolled out on November 4th. That was a great day in history for us. That was awesome. Um, we have a wiki page which uh, talks, which has instructions for configuring um, software with uh, two-factor. Uh, it's right there. Um, if you 
if you have trouble doing it, I think most of the kinks have been ironed out for the most part. Sometimes uh, MOBA X term has some funky issues with, with Duo, um, but I think we can handle those on like a case by case right now, because I think for the most part it works. Um, so uh, if you have MOBA X term, um, oh, I don't have a slide for this actually. So if you have MOBA X term, um, what you're gonna wanna do is in the, uh, when, when you launch it in the top left corner, um, you're gonna see a session button. Um, you click the session icon uh, and then you are gonna hit SSH and put in all your all your stuff. Uh, the host is gonna be terra.timewood.edu. Um, and then you specify your username and the port number is 22. Uh, let's see. Okay, yeah, sure, I got that one. Um, if you don't want to use mobile XTERM, remember again, you can use the portal, the, the link to the portal is in the chat. Um, if, if you joined a little late, uh, you could, and you, you missed that link, um, ask somebody for it. I think Shana can drop it for you. Um, this is what Duo looks like, this, this kind of in this corner right here. This is what Duo prompts you with when you SSH in. Uh, we're gonna see that in just a second. Um, it says Duo, it's gonna give you, you're in SSH in, it's gonna give you a whole bunch of warning messages saying, um, you know, the data here is for this person only and for the students of, or for the, it, it's the, the generic, you know, A&M system, computer system warning. And then you're gonna be given um, this right here. Uh, you're gonna put your password in and then after your password, it's gonna say Duo two-factor login for your net ID. And it's gonna ask you, do you want a push notification? Do you want a phone call? Or do you want um, the SMS one? Um, so what it's gonna ask for is, uh, you can't see it because this is blocking it, but um, it asks you for an option, one, two, or three. So you're gonna, I, I use the Duo push. So I put one and then um, it pushes me a notification, a, 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 uh, notification to approve and I approve it and I log in. Um, that's how Duo works with SSH. Um, SFTP clients also have Duo um, and they kind of handle it a little funkier. Sometimes they, they bring up a prompt and you can, uh, it's, it's always going to ask you for this right here. So first it's always going to ask you for which methods you want to authenticate with the push notification, the phone call or the, the SMS passcode. Um, so you choose that and then um, after you choose that, then you know you it logs you in. Um, when SCP works, uh, FileZilla was the one that we used to use a whole lot, and then FileZilla just decided it did not want to work with Duo at all. So um, for Mac operating systems, uh, we suggest CyberDuck now, which is actually what I use on, on this Mac now. Um, you could also still do uh, SCP and SFTP commands from the uh, Linux from the terminal and from MobX term. Um, but um, unfortunately, like you know, like the way of FileZilla, not all software supports um, SSH plus Duo um, or SFTP and MATLAB, that sort of thing. Uh, so, so there are some, you know, you kind of have to get creative uh, with these things. Um, but so far, I think we found a way to get around most of them. If you have trouble, send us an email and we could we can work through it. Okay, so let's talk about file systems and user directories. Uh, let's see if we move this. Everything going on in the chat, we're all good here. Okay. Uh, so file systems and user directories. Uh, let's log into Terra. So here I'm on my terminal. Um, let me increase this tech to this size. And I'm just gonna say SSH um, Dylan at Terra. Dot time or dot edu. Ask for my password. Ask for my duo prompt. And then I approve it. Okay, so now I've logged in and uh, I'm on a login node. So you see it says T login uh, uh, 0301. So um, right now we're talking about file systems and directories. So there are two. Uh, file systems on Terra. Uh, on Ada, there are three. On Terra, there are two. Uh, they are home user and scratch user net ID. So since I just logged in, I'm in home Dylan. Home is limited to 10 gigs or 10,000 files. 
So these are the, the quotas that we, the default quotas. Um, home is typically for small to modest amounts of processing. It's probably best to not do any processing here in general. Um, home is backed up nightly. Um, I think it's backed up nightly. Uh, so we have archives of everybody's home. That's why we have to limit it to 10 gigs. Uh, and we do not ever expand um, the quotas of your home directory. So your home is always going to be 10 gigs or 10,000 files, whichever one you hit first. Um, Scratch, on the other hand, is the temporary storage for large files for ongoing comp uh, computations. It's not intended to be a long-term storage area though, uh, just so you know. So uh, it's limited to one terabyte or actually this is incorrect, um, it is 250,000 files. Um, 50,000 was the old limit. Now it is, um, I think if you apply for an account, if you were a totally new user and applied for an account, you'd get a, a file limit of 250K. Um, so you can view how much usage you're using and uh, in your current quotas with the command show quota. So let's run that show quota. And we can see um, my home, I'm using 2.3 gigs uh, out of 10 and 3,000 files and my limit is 10. And then my scratch, I'm using 12.3 gigs um, with the one terabyte limit and then a 1 million file limit. Um, so my limit is a million. I think that's a million. Yeah, um, because I was, I was doing some work. So I had asked one of the, one of the staff members to, to increase my limit because I was um, building some, uh, I don't remember what I was building, some virtual environments that had a whole bunch of small files. Oh, I need to clean this out, look at that. Um, so yeah, so my limit is higher in Scratch. You can ask us for an increase in your Scratch, uh, both your disk usage and your file limit. Um, most of the time we can work to accommodate you as long as it's like a reasonable request, um, but it never hurts to ask uh, and that's the only way it would ever get um, increased. Um, if you're working in a group and you need to share a directory, uh, we ask that you, you ask us at, to create one for you instead of just opening up your Scratch directory to everybody with the chmod command, you know, you just do like chmod 777 or something like that. Um, we ask that you don't do that. And instead you send us an email and say, hey, I'm working in this group. Um, these are my students or these are my researchers. And um, can you, can you uh, create a space for us? Um, and we will create a, a directory for that group that the people, you know, you tell us have access to it. Um, and this just says, don't show your home scratcher to your directories. Okay, software. So we talked about files and their limits. Um, so software, uh, I will refer you to the wiki page for instructions and examples. Um, there's a whole bunch of uh, software on the clusters. Um, there's license restricted software. Um, so uh, for this license restricted software, uh, it's only available to those who's, who, whoever administers the software, um, they, they kind of, they maintain a list, a list of students that they want to have access to it, or, or uh, sorry, students and researchers, not just students. Um, so if you want to uh, be added to that list, um, typically you'll, you'll go to them, um, or you'll come to us and then, you know, we'll refer you to them and then you could work out permission from them. Uh, if once you get their permission, they email us and then we can uh, uh, add you to the list of people who have access to the software. Um, you can't even see license restricted software if you're not in the if you're not in the group for it. Um, so uh, it won't even show up in in the searches. Um, for software installation um, or help, um, so some software you can install yourself um, if you're if you're uh, privy enough to it. Uh, you can install it in your scratch, uh, typically in your scratch. You, I guess you could install it in your home, but that would use up a lot of your space. Um, probably want to do it in your scratch. Um, if you if you want us to do it um, and install the software as a, as a module, uh, that's going to take a little while longer. You'd have to send an email to us. Um, and the software request queue, uh, so to speak, is, is pretty long because people are always asking for software. We try to <clears throat> we try to prioritize the software that is the most popular, so the ones we see the most requests for, or that would get the most use, um, as opposed to just spending lots of hours compiling the software that you know maybe two people need. Um, it's for the greater good, um, so we we try to to 
to uh, install the, the most popular software first. Um, but most software is already installed and available as modules, which we're going to talk about in like the next slide. Um, and here's just a reminder to not use the sudo command when you're installing software. Um, you, you probably don't need it, um, especially if you're just installing it locally in your own drive, or in your own space. Um, the sudo command, like I said, is typically for like system-wide configuration. So uh, application modules. Um, installed applications are available as modules, um, which are available to all users. Uh, some things to remember, you want to purge unused modules before loading new ones. Um, and you want to avoid loading modules in your bash RC. Um, so if you don't know what your bash RC is, um, don't worry about it. That's great. Uh, you won't load any modules there anyway. Um, so these are some simple commands that we're going to run. Uh, so, so let's go to Terra and do them. So the first one is module list. Module list uh, lists all loaded modules. So I'm over here on Terra. Let me just check this chat real quick, make sure. Okay, uh, we had two questions, sorry. Um, uh, for a commercial uh, software purchased by the department, how to allow the usage only to our office members? Um, so for that one, uh, you send us an email and you say, hey, I have this software, um, I have this license, and I only want um, our people to use it. Um, you send us an email and then when we will put the license on our server, um, we'll install the software if it's not already there, and then with the list of people that you give us, your your office members, uh, we'll make that software available only to y'all. Um, and then can we run executables, for instance, a simulation model compiled with Fortran? Um, yes, you can. Um, so I think the, ooh, I think I took out the computing environment slide because it was really dense. But the short answer is yes. Um, the clusters have uh, compilers on there, so um, if you compile it, you can you can run stuff there. Um, uh, you'd probably want to run, you, you'd probably want to submit it as a, as a job. Uh, you probably don't want to just run it like dot slash, you know, run it on your, in your, on the login node. Um, we're going to talk about submitting jobs later, but if you have an executable, um, assuming it can run on an x86 cluster, which I forgot to mention, Tara is an x86 64 bit cluster. Um, so pretty standard stuff. Um, if you have it and it can run, then yeah, you could, you could run it as a job. Um, Okay, so uh, back to application modules. Um, we were going to we were going to run some of these slides or some of these um, commands right here. So, like I said, module list loads uh, or lists all your loaded modules. So I just logged in. I don't think I have any modules loaded. I shouldn't because I haven't loaded any. So I'm going to say module list, and it says no modules loaded. I'm also going to clear my screen for some extra room here. So again, module list. No modules loaded. Um, but I want to use MATLAB um, because I want to use MATLAB. So I don't know what MATLAB versions are available. So I'm going to say module spider MATLAB. Spider is the spider is the search basically. So we're saying call the module system and I want to search for MATLAB. Um, so you'll notice MATLAB is lowercase here. Uh, a spider is Kind of funny sometimes. Most of the time, I'd say like ninety percent of the time, spider is case insensitive or yeah, case insensitive. It doesn't care if it's a capital or a, or a lowercase. It's going to look for both. Um, there are some corner cases where uh, I think if spider finds an exact match, um, it'll ignore all the other matches it gets. So um, if you're searching for software, um, I, I would I would try both. If you search for MATLAB like this, this will return MATLAB. But um, if you search for like another niche software, um, and it doesn't come up, try you know spelling it exactly. Try being case sensitive, um, and you might get some results. Um, so this is what the output from Spider looks like. Um, it's going to return all the instances that uh, of uh, of modules with MATLAB in it. So this is actually this is not MATLAB. This is uh, Cafe with MATLAB loaded as well. Um, but I just want MATLAB. So I'm just going to scroll down with my arrow keys on my keyboard, um, down, down, down. And now I see, oh, here's MATLAB. Um, and then I see a description, a numerical computing environment and fourth generation programming language, down, 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 down. And now here are all the versions. So we have MATLAB from 2016B all the way up to 2019B. So I want the latest one. I'm just going to take this. Um, I'm going to copy it. And then to escape this kind of 
to get my prompt back, I'm just gonna hit Q on my keyboard. So hit Q, and now I have my prompt right here. And now I want to, I'm loading it, right? Yeah, I'm gonna load it. So I'm gonna say module load, and then paste in the version of the software. In this case, the latest MATLAB, MATLAB 2019B. Hit enter, and then it's uh, loading right now. Let's check the chat. All right, there's Marinus. Marinus to the rescue. Okay, um, so now we've loaded MATLAB, and we're gonna run module list again. And now when we run module list, we see currently loaded modules MATLAB R2017B. Um, and then just to prove to you that it's running, if I say MATLAB, it's gonna start running MATLAB and then uh, I don't I don't want it to run, but yeah. Uh, so now now calling MATLAB would open the MATLAB software. Um, so now we want to remove MATLAB. So I'm gonna say module purge, hit enter. And now we're gonna do module list. So after we purge, we have no modules loaded. And if I say MATLAB again, uh, MATLAB command not found. So essentially, when you when you want to use the software, you search for it using Spider. When you find the one that you want, you load it with module load. Um, when you after you've module loaded the software, um, that software, all of its relevant files and executables and stuff are placed into your path. So when you call that software, just like I did right here when I said MATLAB, uh, the system's able to find it and then runs it. Um, the reason we do it like this is because, as you saw up here, we have we have lots of versions of software of the same software. So uh, loading one by default for everybody would be insane. Um, there's like there's thousands of modules on here, thousands of a whole bunch of versions. So obviously, um, it cuts down on the the mix mix matching stuff, and it's easier for us to manage like that. Um, also easier for you to get the specific version of software that you want. Um, so that's a quick rundown of the module system. Um, so modules and tool chains. Uh, yeah, let's talk about this. Um, so you want to load modules with the same tool chains in your job scripts. So tool chains are kind of what we call, tool chains are all of the tools that you use to compile stuff. Um, so these, uh, the 2018B and uh, GCC core 7.3, these are these are really stable, which is why we recommend them still. Um, we have newer versions. I think we have like the Intel compilers and the, the IOL, IOM KL ones that are like from, I think we, have, we at least have the 2019 versions. I'm pretty sure we have the 2020 versions too, but the 2018 versions are very stable. So that's why they're listed here as like the recommended ones. Um, so, you know, Intel 2018P, this, this, doesn't, this isn't really a software, this is a tool chain. Um, and so what is a tool chain? A tool chain is just a collection of compilers and libraries. Um, so uh, this is the math kernel library, this is the uh, free and open source, and then this is uh, the good old GNU compiler collection, um, and then the Intel compilers. Um, so the key takeaway from here is that we don't want to mix uh, tool chains in your, in your job script. So if you're module loading a whole bunch of uh, software, typically you'll, you'll probably need to module load more than one most of the time. Um, you, you want to look at the software that you're loading right here. So module load um, HI uh, high sat two. So the way that these uh, these versions of software in, in the module system, they kind of have a, uh, they have their own syntax. So first it's the software. So high sat two and then slash and then the version of the software. So 2.0.4 and then the dash. And then after the dash, we see the tool chain that it was compiled with. So this is the free and open source 2016B um, toolchain. And then we have top hat uh, version 2.1.1 dash, and then the tool chain it was compiled with, and then the Python version that it also comes with too. So this comes with this comes with the tool chain and another um, software, specifically Python 2.7. Um, so the important thing here, like I said, is you don't want to mix. So this would be a bad example because we're loading uh, we're loading a software with the FOSS, the free and open source toolchain, and the Intel 2017 toolchain, and the Intel 2015 toolchain. So something here would break for sure, positive. 
Um, I think if you, the module system we've implemented now, if you try to, if you try to run this, or if you tried to, uh, if you, yeah, if, if you load um, mixed tool chains like this, sometimes the, the module system will catch it and say, uh, hey, you loaded this and we've changed a whole bunch of these, like we've replaced a whole bunch of the, um, the, the tool chains that you had loaded already. Um, so it kind of gives you a warning, but um, that, that, this is typically um, a big problem right here. So just try not to uh, mix tool chains Try to find the ones that match. So you know, if you want, if you need to use these, find the top hat version that was compiled with the free and open source, or, or better yet, just use the Intel one. So use the high set that was compiled with the Intel toolchain. Um, same rule applies for compilers and libraries. Yeah. So so if you loaded Intel 2018b and then you loaded uh, GCC Core 7.3, uh, you you probably get some messages to the LMOD system. But that's uh, the breakdown of modules and toolchains. This is a lot of information. Um, a lot of it is also on our wiki, um, hprc.tamu.edu slash wiki. Uh, you can go there and you can search, you can read all about this. There's a ton more information, but because we have to kind of confine, uh, confide this whole thing into like a 45, 50 minute uh, little course, so I have time for questions at the end. I'm trying to go quick. Um, I will stick around for a little bit after for some questions. Okay, consumable competing resources. So, in the job file that we talked about at the very beginning, uh, you specify a couple things. Uh, you specify how many cores you want to use, how much memory you want to use, uh, how long you want the job to run for, which is called the wall time, and then whether or not you're going to use a GPU or not. Um, that's what you specify in your job file. And then uh, when you submit your job, uh, your the billing system, so the billing system is called AMS. Um, AMS, the account management system, calculates um, how much your job costs in terms of SUs. Um, SUs are the service unit and they're kind of like the currency for submitting jobs. Um, you can list, you can see your, your uh, accounts, how much currency you have, computing currency, uh, with this command, my project. So over here on Terra, I'm gonna control L to clear my screen. I'm gonna say my project. Oh, sorry. My project minus L. This might take a little while. Um, and this is going to give an output that looks similar to this one down here, and it's going to list uh, your NetID's project accounts. Um, I think I have only have one. Um, yeah, so um, it gives me the uh, allocation number, um, the year for this allocation. Um, it tells me whether or not this is my default allocation. Um, it tells me how many SUs I was given, how many I've used, and then my current balance, and then uh, my uh, PI. So. Um, this is important because this tells you how many SUs you have left. So obviously I have 4,000 SUs here, and then uh, here's my uh, account number or allocation number. We kind of use those interchangeably here. And then the last important thing from this takeaway from my project right here is the default account. I only have one account, so by default, it's my default. If you have more than one, um, you'll see uh, the, other, um, the other accounts will have an N next to it. Um, no, um, your default account is the one that gets charged when you do not specify in your job script uh, which account to charge. So the account number in your job script is an optional specification. We're going to see a, an example job script in like the next couple slides. And uh, if you don't, if you don't use that option, uh, which you don't have to, because so, it's optional, uh, the AMS system will use your default account. It is possible for you to not have a default account set um, in some corner cases where your accounts roll over. If you don't have a default account set and you try to submit a job without specifying which allocation you want to charge, um, I think AMS gives you a message that says, I don't know if it, I don't know the error it gives you. It will, it will, you won't be able to do it. Um, so you probably want to check uh, my project first and you want to see, um, do I have a sufficient balance to cover this account or to cover this job? And also, um, am I using the correct account? Do I have a, a default account set? So that's SUs. Um, the other resources are licenses. Uh, so um, uh, some software is, is limited you know, uh, behind licenses, uh, specifically like Ansys and stuff. I think MATLAB uses licenses too. Um, so if you uh, are submitting jobs that require the use of software-restricted um, software, 
uh, you have to make sure that we have enough licenses for it. So ANSYS is kind of the big one because um, uh, we used to only have 50. Um, so we have a license status checker tool, which is this, uh, it's a script which we uh, make available to everybody. So from, uh, let's, let's search for ANSYS. So the script is license status. Did I spell that right? Yeah. Um, and then dash S. So there's a couple options here. You can say dash A to show all or dash S to show specific ones. Uh, we're gonna say dash S ANSYS. Oh, oh, I did not spell that right. C E N S E dash S. Oh, ANSYS. So uh, running that command shows us all the licenses we have. Yeah, so now we have more than 50. Um, and it tells us right here, um, there are 125 available, 93 in use, or uh, sorry, 125 issued, 93 in use, 32 available. Um, the script will populate with, with some nice color. So you can see that this one is yellow because it's kind of almost uh, almost out, like at 70% or so. Um, if, it's, if there's barely any licenses left, uh, it'll come up as red. Um, so it looks like not, there's not a whole lot of people using ANSYS right now. So, so jump on it if you need to use ANSYS. Perfect time. Um, ANSYS is, is typically the one that we get the most uh, questions about like, hey, why, why are there no ANSYS licenses? Um, it's because other people are using them. Um, if other people are using them, then you're just gonna have to wait for them. Uh, they they kind of go on a first come first serve basis. Um, so, so yeah, uh, you can use the license um, status minus H to get some more options. Um, list all the names, list the names of software, that stuff. Um, so SUs are consumed when you submit jobs. Um, licenses are required uh, to run software that requires licenses, obviously. There's a set finite amount of them. So uh, if they're being used, you're just gonna have to wait. Um, if they're always, always in use and you can't find, like you seem to not be able to, to use them, um, send us an email and, and you know maybe we could figure out why one person is using all the licenses. Most of the time it's it's just, there's a lot of people using the software, so you just have to wait. Um, okay, we went over this already. This is how to check your SU balance, um, my project. Uh, and then if you want to change your default account, I didn't say this, you can change it with my project minus D and then the account number. Um, my project minus H shows you some more help options. Um, okay, batch queues. So job submissions are auto assigned to batch queues based on the resources requested. So when you submit the job, your job file, remember it, it uh, specifies how many cores and nodes and how much, uh, how much time it wants to run for, or you want it to run for. Um, those parameters are taken uh, by Slurm and used to put your job into a queue. Um, so it's just kind of a way so we could organize the, the use of, of the nodes more efficiently. Um, you could see the queue information on Terra using the, uh, um, the S info or Sinfo command. Um, so over here, if I say Sinfo, we get all of these queues. So these are the partitions we see short, medium, long, GPU, VNC, extra long, all that. And then over here, we see how many nodes are available, idle, offline, and total. Yeah, I think that's total. Yeah, it's total. Um, and then CPUs over here as well. Um, uh, the batch queues, that's a big, big topic. There's a whole lot more information on it um on our wiki uh which we don't have time to cover here so i'm just going to skip over all that but uh yeah when you submit your job the ams system will tell you what queue you've uh, been your job has been put on probably on short or medium if it's a small one a small job um and then mm, at that point then you just wait until the uh the jobs the job schedule will, will run your job eventually as long as you submitted it um so here this is an example um of a job script uh, so at the very top, you have the shebang uh, for setting the the um, the interpreter. Uh, we're using the bash interpreter here, uh, and then these are all the necessary job specifications. Uh, you'll notice that they start with the hashtag and uh, immediately followed by s batch. So hashtag s batch, and then a double dash, and then the the uh, name of the directive, and then the value for the directive. So um, export none, get user environment uh, l, uh, job name. Um, Job example one, time one, uh, 30, zero. So this is in hours, minutes, seconds. You could specify days before this if you did a, like a one and then a dash. So it'd be one day, dash, one hour, 30 minutes. Um, 
n tasks is how many cores. Memory is how many how much memory you want per node. On on Terra, you specify memory per node as opposed to per core. Um, uh, and then the output. So where do you want the output to go? So what do you want to call the output? In this case, we're naming the output std out dot percent j. Percent j is a is a variable which is going to be uh, populated with the job ID. So um, obviously your your job gets an ID when it gets run. Um, so all these necessary job specifications they have to be there. If, if one of these isn't here or it's somehow super super incorrect, um, the job scheduler will or AMS will tell you that when you submit it and say it's missing the specification. I can't schedule your job. Um, the optional specifications are and and this this isn't all of them. This is just kind of like a quick uh, overview. Uh, is like I said, the account number. So you can specify the account here with double dash account equals and then the account number you get from my project. Um, mail type all and mail user. Mail type um, equals all. That says that you want to be emailed when the job uh, begins and when the job ends. Um, and then obviously your email is, is the email that wants to send to you. So you would use these if, if you're submitting a job that you don't know, like it's not gonna run immediately and you don't really know what it's gonna run. Maybe it's a really big job. Um, so that's why you'd use those. Most of the time, you could just kind of um, copy this and uh, uh, take all these out, the optional, optional ones, um, unless you really want to be notified. Um, for these job specification, specifications up here, typically what uh, most uh, newer users do is they go to our wiki um, and they, we have a page on job scripts there. Uh, they, they copy all of the um, necessary specifications and then they just paste them into a file on Terra or Ada and then you know, modify them. So instead of having to write all this out, um, so yeah, that's all we'll talk about right there. Um, and then um, the required module. So, okay, so after at the very top, you have your specifications. After all of your um, SBATCH specifications, at the very bottom, uh, below, below all that, you have your actual code to be run. So this code that's run right here will be run on the compute node as if you had typed it in um, kind of in serial like this. Uh, so in this specific case, this job would, it would take all these specifications, put it on a node that has that, that looks like this with this environment up here, and it would run this. It would module load Python 3.7 with the Intel 2018B toolchain, and then it would run um, dot slash my program dot pi. Um, so this executes the job. And then uh, when your job finishes, uh, it'll, it'll send out to, um, it, it'll send standard out. Um, to wherever you submitted this job from. So if you submitted this from slash home slash Dylan, inside slash home slash Dylan, you'd see standard out dot percent J. And then you could open that text file um, to see the output. Um, okay, so important uh, job parameters. Uh, we, we talked about this. Um, th there's, the wiki goes much more in depth. Um, so the first two, initialize the environment. Um, time obviously specifies the time and tasks is how many cores uh, task per node says exactly that how many tasks per node how many cores do you want to put uh, allocate on each node and then um, memory how much memory you want to use okay uh, mapping jobs to cores per node um, so this is just kind of a quick overview it says uh, s uh, batch n tasks 28 tasks per node 28 so we take the total tasks and divide by tasks per node, and that gives us how many cores per node. So obviously 28 divided by 28 says we're going to use the entire node. We want all 28 cores. Um, this is kind of hard because this requires the entire node to be not busy. Uh, over here, we have 28, uh, we say 28 tasks, and then um, 14. So 28 divided by 14 is 2. So we're using two nodes, 14 cores per node. This is probably the better case. This is uh, more reasonable. Um, uh, scenario. Uh, this would probably queue faster than, than A. And then lastly, we have C, which might queue the fastest because you're only asking for, it depends on how much memory you're asking for, but you're only asking for seven cores per node. So uh, 28 divided by seven gives us four nodes uh, total that we're using, but we're only using uh, seven cores on each node. Um, this kind of fragments it a little uh, more than these. This might run faster, but you might see some other issues because um, these uh, white cores over here, other people could be running on them and uh, their jobs, uh, assuming that it, it could cause issues if their job um, overreaches its parameters a little bit, which does happen on occasions, um, but uh, it's best to kind of not fragment so much like this. You might want to use something like like uh, two, two nodes instead of four. 
Um, okay, pop quiz, the last pop quiz of today. Uh, how many nodes is this job requesting? Um, so we have, there's a pop quiz over here. Uh, we have n tasks 80 and uh, tasks per node 20. So we would take 80 and divide by 20 and uh, got you again. Yeah, so, so uh, how many nodes? So remember we have cores and then nodes. Cores, uh, nodes are made up of cores. So core, uh, nodes are the big blocks and then cores are the small ones on it. Um, yeah, the correct answer is in fact four. So we take the total amount of uh, cores and we divide that by the cores per node. So 80 divided by 20 gives us uh, four, which is B. Um, thank you for that. Um, so here is another example um, and with a nice little diagram up here of how many cores we're using. So we're saying um, here's all the initialization stuff. Uh, the job name is job example one. We want it to run for one hour and 30 minutes. We want to use one core and two gigs. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so that's all this optional stuff. The output's going to be named standard out. Uh, we're going to load Intel 2018B. And then you can't see right here, but this just says dot slash run my program. So it's running whatever program you're running. Um, right now, this would only use one core on the node. So this is a really small job. This would probably run really quick. And it only costs about 1.5 SUs. Um, we didn't talk about the calculation of SUs, but uh, it, the calculation of SUs takes into account three parameters. It takes into account um, how long you want the job to run for, how many uh, cores you're asking for, and then how much memory. Um, there's some math behind it. I won't explain that um, because it would take too long, but it's on the wiki. Uh, so time, cores, and memory. Uh, you could kind of roughly think of it as uh, one core for one hour. That's, that's a really rough estimate. Um, but it was one core per one hour and then you know, two gigs of memory factors into that somehow. Um, so how do you actually submit your job? So you take all this stuff, you make a job file. Um, so you copy all this into a text file and name it whatever. And then to actually submit it, you say sbatch. So you say sbatch example one dot job. Uh, this is what AMS looks like when, it, when you submit something. It says submitted batch job 161997. This is the job ID. Um, your job is charged as below. So it's saying we're going to charge this account and this is the current balance and this job will require three SUs. Um, so that's what it looks like when you successfully submit a job. Uh, once it submits, uh, you could check its uh, status with SQ, uh, SQ-U specifically. So we'll do this right quick over here on the cluster. I'm going to control L for screen. Um, I don't have a job script to submit. Oh, actually I do. Cat test job real quick. Okay, I have a test job that I could submit, so that's great. I'm gonna say sbatch uh, test dot job. I didn't even look and see if it's gonna go, but okay, yeah, so it works. So I submitted it and it's gonna charge my account. Um, I have 4,000 SUs, it's gonna use 42 of them. Um, and now I wanna see if it's running, so I do sq minus u and then my net ID. And nothing's there um, because this job probably ran super, super fast. Um, so if, if you have a job that just does something like says, hello world or something, which is probably what this job did, um, or if it has an error, uh, it'll just run and then die immediately. Um, so if I list everything here, now I have some I have output here, which came from this job. Um, so let's cat the example output and see. So this is what the output looks like. Um, Oh, I just ran NVIDIA SMI, it looks like. Yeah, that's all I did. Um, so the job ran super quick because I just went in there. Um, oh, I ran NVIDIA SMI and then tried to run train.py, but train.py doesn't exist. So um, that's what the output looks like. Um, so when I submitted the job, it submitted successfully, but then I said SQ minus U Dylan and nothing was there. That's my cue to think, oh, the job is already finished. Um, if you use SQ without the minus U option, and you just say SQ, it's gonna show you every single job that's running on the cluster, um, which is hardly useful at all. So SQ minus U, and then the name, I, the, the net ID, or the username of whoever's job you're looking at. Okay, uh, submission and tracking. Um, 
from here, the big one is S cancel. Uh, if you wanted to cancel a job, uh, you would use SQ to see the job that you want to uh, cancel. So this is kind of messed up because I have the, the text really big, but this first column over here gives you the, te the, the job ID. So these are all job IDs right here. Uh, I could take this job ID um, and say um, S cancel. Um, and then the, the uh, job ID, um, that's not my job. So I'm not gonna do that, but that's how you cancel a job. Um, I don't think I could cancel it anyway. I don't have um, pseudo privileges. So, uh, but that's how you cancel a job. Maybe you submit it and you realize, oh, I, I know it's gonna air, it's gonna fail or something. So S cancels to, to, to kill a job. S queues to search them, S cancels to kill it. Um, this is a multi-core single node. Um, I think that's pretty much it. So this will be the last slide, then we'll take questions because we have another primer that's gonna start here in a little bit too. Um, so uh, this is saying, uh, I want to use uh, multi-core single nodes. This is saying, I want uh, one node and 14 cores, as you can see up here in this diagram. So 28 cores total, we're using half of that. Uh, and we're familiar with this already. Um, if you have insufficient SUs, this is what you'll see. Uh, Sbatch my job, he tries to submit my job and he gets this error. Uh, balance is not sufficient. Uh, what do you do if you need more SUs? Um, you have to ask your PI to transfer SUs to your account uh, or apply for more SUs if you are a PI. Um, PIs are typically faculty um, and professors and stuff. If you're a student, um, you have to go to your advisor. Um, go to your advisor and tell your advisor, hey, I need more SUs. They'll, they'll apply for a startup account. Uh, list you as a researcher, and then uh, you'll you you they can transfer SUs to you from that account. Um, okay, we're gonna skip over line terminators because uh, we're gonna talk about that in Linux. Uh, it's not really applicable here. So yeah, if you guys need help, uh, first check the FAQ. Uh, there's a user guide right there, or email your questions to us. Uh, help hprc.tamer.edu, um, and we will get back to you. So that's pretty much all I've got. Uh, finish with three minutes to spare. But um, let's see, does anybody have any questions? Thank you guys for coming. Um, um, if you guys have any questions, I will be here for a little while longer and then we're gonna move over to Linux. Uh, I don't know if it's this, um, if it's this room, but thank you guys for coming. Uh, next week, we're gonna be talking about ADA, so similar thing. Uh, I might cut these slides down a little bit because yeah, that was, I was, had to go really fast for that. Um, but ADA is next week, uh, our other cluster. Um, and after this is Terra. Uh, how many help requests does HPRC receive for, for Terra per day? Uh, for Terra specifically, um, I don't know. Um, we do receive a lot of emails for a lot, for, for a wide, um, for a wide uh, variety of topics. Um, so we, we try to answer them uh, as they come in, but some of them require a lot of, uh, like for instance, the ones that take the longest are the software installations. Um, uh, what time can I request for a job to run? Um, you could submit jobs at any time. So the job scheduler uh, will just, will always be running. Um, so you could submit your jobs at any time to the job scheduler and then the job scheduler will, will the job scheduler is not a person, it's, it's like an application that's running on the, in the cluster. So um, it'll, it'll figure out um, where the resources are and stuff uh, and, and allocate your job. Um, show quota update daily, show quota updates in real time. So um, if you, if you download a whole bunch of files uh, and then show quota, it'll be updated, yeah. So uh, that updates in real time. The max length of time I'm allowed to run a job. Uh, so the time that you're allowed to run a job is dictated by the queue. Well, okay, guess the queue is dictated by the time. Um, you know what, I don't wanna give you a wrong answer, so I'm gonna Google that. I, it's gonna be either seven or 21, which is a very big, uh, it's a very big, window. Um, so the wiki is, is the best place to go for things like this. And we're going to go to uh, the queue, batch queues. So um, looks like 21 days is the longest you could submit. So uh, short queue would run for 30 minutes or two hours, uh, one day, seven days, and then extra long is uh, 21 days. 
Um, can I create example one, but how do I upload the terrain runner? Okay, uh, so, um, so you create uh, the dot job file on your computer and then you have to transfer it up to Ada or, or to Terra, sorry. Um, so you transfer it using, um, uh, you upload it essentially. So you could either go to the portal here. Um, so you go to the portal, you go to the dashboard and then files uh, over here. And then you hit upload and you could uh, browse your computer and upload like that. Or you could download a, a SFTP client um, so if you're using mobile Xterm, mobile Xterm has a side panel, which has a mobile, uh, which has an SFTP, uh, functionality built into it. Um, or you could use, uh, like Filezilla was one that didn't work. I don't, I don't know if you're using a windows or a Mac cyber duck, if you're on Mac works, uh, win SCP, if you're on windows, these are all applications that you can download for free. And then you connect to Ada or, or Terra, I keep on saying Ada. Um, and then, and then you could transfer stuff up like that. Or you could do it from the command line if you're you, you could you know um, r sync r sync it up through the command line. Okay, yeah, um, yeah. So you can go to the portal and then upload it, or on the left side. I, I don't have mobile extern because I guess I'm on a Mac, but um, on the left side, um, you could you could upload that. Uh, do you also upload the scripts you want to run that way? And it is yes, exactly, yeah. So all the stuff you need to run. Uh, on on Terra, like if you're gonna run uh, the code on Terra, you're gonna need to upload the data sets and the, the applicable scripts and stuff, all that. Uh, you'd wanna upload it to your um, to your scratch. So yeah, I want to load more than one tool chain, how to not mix them. Um, so you just want to check, um, so module, Spider Intel. So, okay, so this is the Intel tool chains right here. We have a whole bunch of them. Yeah, so we have 2020. So uh, you're gonna be looking for these right here. So this was the Intel 2020 tool chain. And so let's say uh, module spider um, Ansys. Ansys? No, Ansys only do both with it. Um, let's check Warp. Module spider. Um, so right here, so this is Wharf, and this is built with, uh, this tells you the tool chain it's built with. So if I loaded this version of Wharf, this one's built with the free and open source tool chain, FOSS 2017A. Um, I don't, I wouldn't want to load any other software that is built with anything but the 2017A FOSS tool chain. So this is kind of what you're looking for. You see the, ver the software, the version, and then the dash and the tool chain. So everything after the dash, um, should be the same, um, th this specific part right here. So that, that's kind of the idea of, of don't mixing, of not mixing tool chains. Um, you, you know, don't worry about breaking the, the, the supercomputer. Um, you, you know, you're not going to break it. Uh, so feel free to, you know, like to go on here and make mistakes and stuff. Um, I'm just trying to, to let you guys know, you know, what might happen. Um, so if you, if you, if you load, if you mix tool chains, uh, you'll, at worst, you'll just get an error and, and a bit of a headache trying to figure it out. Um, but you know, we're always an email away for help. Um, do slurm jobs run as if they're running under my credentials? So if I put my dot job file, everything just as I would enter in a terminal session. Um, uh, exactly, Jeff. So uh, they run. So the first two top two parts of the um, job script initialize the environment, um, and they actually copy your environment. So in in a perfect world, they exactly copy your environment from where you submit the job from. Um, for the most part, if you have like a, a virtual environment that you need to activate, you still have to activate that. But um, they do run, uh, quote unquote, under your credentials. Uh, and uh, you can refer to the file paths um, as if the job was, think of the job as like a ghost you standing where you are standing. Um, and, and it will execute the jobs relative to where you submit the job from. Does that make sense? Um, Okay, thank you. That's great. Um, can you specify the path of standard out? Yes, you can. So, uh, so you you could specifically say. Uh, so the examples that we saw here, um, slides, the examples that we saw here. Uh, output standard out. Um, there should actually be an equals here. Output equals standard out. Um, 
this will just put standard out wherever I submit the job from. If I want to be very specific, I can say standard out equals scratch user Dylan standard out. So move this over here. So this would uh, send the output to scratch user Dylan standard out. Um, I could obviously change this and put this anywhere, um, and that would that would throw the output wherever I tell it. Um, will this primarily be posted to the HBRC YouTube page? Um, I, um, oh yeah, Tamu, uh, okay, one at a time, sorry, <laughs> I'm getting lost here. Um, primarily be posted to the YouTube page. Um, I think it might be. Uh, I know we recorded it. Um, I'm not sure what the plan for the recording is, but we can definitely tell them to post it there. Um, I might, if we're going to post it there, I might um, redo it because I had to talk kind of fast to fit this in an hour. Um, but uh, we could definitely do something there, um, Nathaniel. Uh, and how do I set up a distribution of a job submission? The command, um, oh yeah, okay, yeah, so so perfectly, Tamu Batch. So Tamu Batch is, uh, again, to our wiki. Uh, so the wiki is kind of like the end all be all of all information. It's it's the, the wealth of all our, all our information. And uh, when I'm working, I'm always here. So Tamu Batch is a, um, uh, it's it's it automatically submits jobs, uh, so you don't have to write a batch script. Um, um, so you just you provide the execu executable commands and it uh, submits it uh, just like that. Um, it's still um, it's still uh, in development, um, but if you guys want to use it, uh, it would help us out a whole lot. Um, so you you give it the uh, the file, your executable file. Um, was that was that um that was that the file that um Kyle was working on? I thought it was right. Um, Adrian, can we acknowledge Terra Cluster? Uh, yes, please do acknowledge us. There is a page here, I think, uh, which kind of specifies. Um, yes, uh, we we would appreciate it if you acknowledged uh the Terra Cluster and HPRC. Um, in your publications, um, that way we can hang your poster on our wall. Uh, we do like getting acknowledgments. Um, I thought there was a page um, somewhere that we had. Uh, there it is. Yeah, Lucy's got it right there. Boom. Um, I thought it was on our wiki. Yeah. Uh, it looks like it's on our website. So perfect right there. We do appreciate those acknowledgments um, very much. Okay. Are we still good? Oh, okay, Shana left. Shana went to uh, the other meeting. Anybody else have questions? Uh, so what should I put minus zero when submitting the job? Um, uh, are you talking about in the job script? Um, let's go to Terra. Oh, um, so, um, so that kind of depends on your code. Um, it, that's a case by case thing. Um, if you're, so to, to remember, uh, the big thing to keep in mind is that the nodes have 28 cores. Um, so you don't want to specify any more cores than uh, are available. Um, so for instance, if, if you selected a value over 28, um, I don't know if the job scheduler would tell you, um, uh, I don't know if the job scheduler would tell you that that's an incorrect, um, request. Hopefully it should, but, um, if you, if you select anything over 28, uh, it, you might just pend indefinitely. So you'd submit your job and your job would just be in SQ pending forever. Um, you can kind of want to play around with it and see what gives you the best, uh, the best as in. The, the fastest um, execution. Um, whenever I've built jobs, I've just kind of, uh, you know, uh, trial and error, baby, trial and error. Um, suggesting uh, 20, if you use 12, 28, you're probably, it's probably gonna take longer uh, to, to submit. Cause like I said, you're gonna use the entire uh, node. Um, so maybe half, half would be good, 14. Um, or if you have an even number, I don't know, I'm not saying that you need to use all 28 cores, but um, 
pick a number smaller than 28, let's say like 14, and then, you know, start there. Um, and then how does Terra compute SU consumed? Um, so Terra computes SUs based on um, how long the job runs for, how many SUs uh, or how many cores it's requesting, and then how much memory it's using. Um, those are the three factors that go into it. Um, and when you submit the job, uh, you'll see AMS calculates the total SU request and pre-charges you that from your account. So you have to have the full balance of the entire job. Um, so let's say um, the job I ran, let's see, okay. This is actually a good example. Um, so when I submit this job, so I'm going to uh, submit this test job and um, AMS says, okay, we looked at your job and we're gonna charge you 42 SUs. So after we charge you 42 SUs, uh, or we're checking to make sure your account has 40, at least 42 SUs in it. Um, but when I run show, or uh, my project minus L, So this was my balance before, it's 4,456 SUs, and uh, the job wanted to use 42. So we'd expect this to be you know, 4,414, right? Um, but when this loads, you'll see that that is not necessarily the case. Ah, okay, well, it is the case. So, and, okay, so I guess bad, bad example here. Um, it pre-charged me the 42 SUs, but the job did not, the job ran instantly. Um, so because it ran instantly, um, probably eventually some of these SUs will be re returned to me. Uh, so the idea here is uh, this requested SUs is the worst case scenario. So it's the total amount of SUs. Um, and then the actual cost, so the actual cost that gets subtracted from you um, is, is uh, less than this number if your job runs for shorter than it ran, it was supposed to run for. So I don't even know what this, uh, capital E. Okay, so this one is using uh, two and a half gigs for um, an hour and 30 minutes. So, um, Okay, well, that, that was a bad example because it was only run for an hour. So what I was trying to say was that, let's say you submit a job that's supposed to run for two days. Um, so it tells you it's going gonna, it's gonna to use uh, 1,000 SUs. Uh, you submit your job, it dies after one day. So you were, at first, you were charged 1,000 SUs because your job might have run for 1,000 SUs worth of time. Um, if it dies after one day, uh, then... Um, if it dies after one day, then you're then you're given the S, you're given the difference. So you'd only be charged for the SUs that did run. Um, I kind of explained that really horribly, but um, it only charges you for SUs that you use. Uh, what happened if your job ends up? Oh, uh, how do I exit an SBatch command? Um, so you don't want to type in SBatch. Uh, when you type in SBatch like this. Uh, um, no, you, you just type sbatch when you when you submit stuff. Um, so you would say sbatch, and then um, like your test job like this, uh, test job. Um, if you actually say sbatch like this, and then you lose your prompt, um, Control C is how I get it back. It's that little character Control F and C. Um, so when you hit that, it, it Control C is the cancel in Linux. So it's saying cancel what you're doing and give me the prompt back. Um, and then Jeff, what happens if your job ends up needing longer than the time? So you submit your job for an hour, your job runs for uh, an hour and then it dies. So whatever happened at, at one hour, whatever it's done up until one hour, it'll, it'll put in the output and send to you or, or put the output wherever you, know, you submitted the job from, but your job will die. Um, so there's really, um, there's really no way to get around that. Uh, so it's, it's better to overestimate in that case because you overestimate and then um, you know, the SUs that you don't, the, the time that you don't use, uh, your job, you refunded those SUs. So always overestimate. Is there a standard way to estimate the time needed? Uh, there is not. Um, we actually get that question a lot. Um, so that's the, another trial and error thing. 
uh, you're just going to have to submit it and then see how far your code gets. And then um, that's why, that's why we always say it's way better to overestimate. So like, you know, if you think your job's going to run for, it's going to need five hours to run, give it 12 hours or 15 hours. And then uh, that way, if something happens, um, you don't, you don't lose all that time. This is especially, you know, the case when you're submitting a job that's going to run for multiple days. Um, because you know you hate for your job that's supposed to run for you know three days actually need four days to run and then you lose three days of progress that'd be horrible so no problem no problem guys anybody else have questions No problem. Oh yeah, so Marinas did mention for longer running jobs, you can request jobs to be extended. So in that case where I said like uh, if it's running for three days and then uh, you figure out that, oh crap, you need an extra day or so, um, you can extend, you can request us to extend uh, your job running, uh, but there are limits on that. Um, tip, it, it's kind of, um, it's kind of, it's kind of iffy. Most of the time we don't do it, but the hard limit is, like Marina said, the Q limit. So, um, for instance, over here on the Q, oh, batch processing, uh, Qs, 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 batch Qs. Um, when your job is submitted, it's submitted to a Q, so you could only extend your job up until the limit of that Q. So, if your job is in the medium Q, you could only extend it for up to one day, um, if that if that makes any sense. So, um, if it's in the extra long Q, you could run it for 21. Um, I believe it has. Um, I think that's why Shana, Shana went over there. Um, so uh, it's supposed to start at 11. I think I was getting some Slack notifications. I'm not teaching that one, so. Um, that'd be cool if I could be in two places at once, but. Okay, so I think we will call it on that. Um, if you guys have any questions or you need to need more specific like one-on-one -on -one help and stuff, um, send us an email at help at hprc.tamer.edu um, and one of us will get back to you. Uh, thank you guys for coming. And am I the host of this meeting? I'm gonna stop sharing. I'm not the host. Lisa, you were the host. Um, so yeah, thank you guys for coming. Um, send us an email if you need any help. I'm going to head over to the other meeting.